recording of john brown by w e b du bois chapter x the great black way part one the spirit of the lord god is upon me because of the lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he hath sent me to bind up the broken-hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound halfway between maine and florida in the heart of the alleghanies a mighty gateway lifts its head and discloses a scene which a century and a quarter ago thomas jefferson said was worth a voyage across the atlantic he continues you stand on a very high point of land on your right comes up the shenandoah having ranged along the foot of the mountain a hundred miles to find a vent on your left approaches the potomac in quest of a passage also in the moment of their junction they rush together against the mountain rend it asunder and pass off to the sea this is harper's ferry and this was the point which john brown chose for his attack on american slavery he chose it for many reasons he loved beauty when i met brown at peterborough in eighteen fifty eight writes sanborn morton played some fine music to us in the parlor among other things schubert's serenade then a favorite piece and the old puritan who loved music and sang a good part himself sat weeping at the air he chose harper's ferry because the united states arsenal was there and the capture of this would give that dramatic climax to the inception of his plan which was so necessary to its success but both these were minor reasons the foremost and decisive reason was that harper's ferry was the safest natural entrance to the great black way look at the map the shaded portion is the black belt of slavery where there were massed in eighteen fifty nine at least three of the four million slaves two paths led southward toward it in the east the way by washington physically broad and easy but legally and socially barred to bondsmen the other way known to harriet tubman and all fugitives which led to the left toward the crests of the alleghanies and the gateway of harper's ferry one has but to glance at the mountains and swamps of the south to see the great black way here amid the mighty protection of overwhelming numbers lay a path from slavery to freedom and along that path were fastnesses and hiding-places easily capable of becoming permanent fortified refuges for organized bands of determined armed men the exact details of brown's plan will never be fully known as reef said john brown was a man who would never state more than it was absolutely necessary for him to do not one of his most intimate associates and i was one of the most intimate was possessed of more than barely sufficient information to enable brown to attach such companion to him a glance at the map shows clearly that john brown intended to operate in the blue ridge mountains rising east of the shenandoah and known at harper's ferry as loudon heights the loudon heights rise boldly five hundred to seven hundred feet above the village of harper's ferry and one thousand feet above the sea they run due south and then southwest dipping down a little the first three miles then rising to fifteen hundred feet which level is practically maintained until twenty-five miles below harper's ferry where the mountains broaden to a dense and labyrinthical wilderness and rise to a height of two thousand or more feet right at this high point and in inside of high knob a peak of twenty four hundred feet began in fauquier county the great black way in this county in eighteen fifty were over ten thousand slaves and six hundred fifty free negroes as compared with nine thousand eight hundred seventy five whites from this county to the southern boundary of virginia was a series of black counties with a majority of slaves containing in eighteen fifty at least two hundred sixty thousand negroes from here the great black way went south as john brown indicated in his diary and undoubtedly in the marked maps which virginia afterward hastily destroyed the easiest way to get to these heights was from harper's ferry an hour's climb from the arsenal grounds would easily have hidden a hundred men in inaccessible fastnesses providing they were not overburdened and even with arms ammunition and supplies they could have repelled without difficulty attacks on the retreat 
forts and defences could be prepared in these mountains and before the raid they had been pretty thoroughly explored and paths marked in harper's ferry just at the crossing of the main road from maryland lay the arsenal the plan without a doubt was first to collect men and arms on the maryland side of the potomac second to attack the arsenal suddenly and capture it third to bring up the arms and ammunitions and together with those captured to cross the shenandoah to loudon heights and hide in the mountain wilderness fourth thence to descend at intervals to release slaves and get food and retreat southward most writers have apparently supposed that brown intended to retreat from the arsenal across the potomac a moment's thought will show the utter absurdity of this plan brown knew guerrilla warfare and the failure of harper's ferry raid does not prove it a blunder from the start the raid was not a foray from the mountains which failed because its retreat was cut off but it was a foray to the mountains with the village and arsenal on the way which was defeated apparently because the arms and ammunition train failed to join the advance guard this then was the great plan which john brown had been slowly elaborating and formulating for twenty years since the day when kneeling beside a negro minister he had sworn his sons to blood feud with slavery the money resources with which john brown undertook his project are not exactly known sanborn says brown's first request in eighteen fifty eight was for a fund of a thousand dollars only with this in the hand he promised to take the field either in april or may mr stearns acted as treasurer of this fund and before the first of may nearly the whole the amount had been paid in or subscribed stearns contributing three hundred dollars and the rest of our committee smaller sums it soon appeared however that the amount named would be too small and brown's movements were embarrassed from the lack of money before the disclosures of forbes came to his knowledge from first to last george l stearns gave in cash and arms about seventy five hundred dollars and garrett smith contributed more than one thousand dollars merriam brought with him six hundred dollars in gold in october between march tenth and october sixteenth brown expended at least twenty five hundred dollars in all sanborn raised four thousand dollars for brown hinton says as near as can be estimated the money received by brown could not have exceeded twelve thousand dollars while the supplies arms etc furnished may have cost ten thousand dollars more of course there were smaller contributions and support coming in but if the total estimate be placed at twenty five thousand dollars for the period between the fifteenth of september eighteen fifty six when he left lawrence kansas and the sixteenth of october eighteen fifty nine when he moved on harper's ferry virginia with twenty-one men it will certainly cover all of the outlay except that of time labor and lives this total however does not include a fund of one thousand dollars raised for his family the civic organization under which brown intended to work has been spoken of the military organization was based on his kansas experience and his reading in his diary is this entry circassia has about five hundred fifty thousand switzerland two million thirty seven thousand thirty guerrilla warfare sea life of lord wellington page seventy one to seventy five mina see also page one o two some valuable hints in the same book see also page one ninety six some most important instructions to officers see also same book page two thirty five these words deep and narrow defiles where three hundred men would suffice to check an army see also page two thirty six on top of page this life of wellington w p garrison states was stockwellers and the pages referred to tell of spanish guerrillas under mina in eighteen ten and of methods of cooking and discipline in one place the author says here we have a chaos of mountains where we meet at every step huge fallen masses of rock and earth yawning fissures deep and narrow defiles where three hundred men would suffice to check an army the alleghanies in virginia and carolina was similar in topography and for the operation here brown proposed a skeleton army which could work together or in small units of any size a company will consist of fifty-six privates twelve non-commissioned officers eight corporals four sergeants and three commissioned officers two lieutenants a captain and a surgeon 
the privates shall be divided into bands or messes of seven each numbering from one to eight with a corporal to each numbered like his band two bands will comprise a section sections will be numbered from one to four a sergeant will be attached to each section and numbered like it two sections will comprise a platoon platoons will be numbered one and two and each commanded by a lieutenant designed by like number four companies composed a battalion four battalions a regiment and four regiments a brigade so much for his resources and plans now for the men whom he chose as co-workers the number of those who took part in the harper's ferry raid is not known perhaps including active slave helpers there were about fifty seventeen negroes reported as probably killed are wholly unknown and those slaves who helped and escaped are also unknown this leaves the twenty-two men usually regarded as making the raid they fall of course into two main groups the negroes and the whites six or seven of the twenty-two were negroes first in importance came osborne perry anderson a free-born pennsylvania mulatto twenty-four years of age he was a printer by trade well educated a man of natural dignity modest simple in character and manners he met john brown in canada he wrote the most interesting and reliable account of the raid and afterward fought in the civil war next came shields green a full-blooded negro from south carolina whence he had escaped from slavery after his wife died leaving a living boy still in bondage he was about twenty-four years old small and active uneducated but with natural ability and absolutely fearless he met brown at the home of frederick douglas who says while at my house john brown made the acquaintance of a colored man who called himself by different names sometimes emperor at other times shields green he was a fugitive slave who had made his escape from charleston south carolina a state from which a slave found it no easy matter to run away but shields green was not one to shrink from hardships or dangers he was a man of few words and his speech was singularly broken but his courage and self-respect made him quite a dignified character john brown saw at once what stuff green was made of and confided to him his plans and purposes green easily believed in brown and promised to go with him whenever he should be ready to move dangerfield newby was a free mulatto from the neighborhood of harper's ferry he was thirty years of age tall and well built with a pleasant face and manner he had a wife and seven children in slavery about thirty miles south of harper's ferry the wife was about to be sold south at this time and was sold immediately after the raid newby was the spy who gave general information to the party and lived out in the community until the night of the attack john a copeland was born of free negro parents in north carolina reared in oberlin and educated at oberlin college he was a straight-haired mulatto twenty-two years of age of medium size and a carpenter by trade hunter the prosecuting attorney of virginia says from my intercourse with him i regarded him as one of the most respectable prisoners that we had he was a copper-colored negro behaved himself with as much firmness as any of them and with far more dignity if it had been possible to recommend a pardon for any of them it would have been for this man copeland as i regretted as much if not more at seeing him executed than any other one of the party Louis Sherard Leary was born in slavery in North Carolina and also reared in Oberlin, where he worked as a harness maker. An Oberlin friend testified, He called again afterward and told me he would like to keep to the amount I had given him and would like a certain amount more for a certain purpose, and was very cheery in his communications to me as to how he was to use it, except that he did inform me that he wished to use it in aiding slaves to escape circumstances just then transpired which had interested me contrary to any thought i ever had in my mind before i had had exhibited to me a daguerreotype of a young lady a beautiful appearing girl who i was informed was about eighteen years of age but here senator mason of the inquisition scented danger and we can only guess the reasons that sent leary to his death he was said to be brown's first recruit outside the kansas band john anderson a free negro from boston was sent by lewis hayden and started for the front 
whether he arrived or was killed or was too late has never been settled the seventh man of possible negro blood was jeremiah anderson he is listed with the negroes in all the original reports of the chatham convention and was as a white virginian who saw him says of middle stature very black hair and swarthy complexion he was supposed by some to be a canadian mulatto he was descended from virginia slaveholders who had moved north and was born in indiana he was twenty-six years old of the white men there were first of all john brown and his family consisting of three sons and two brothers of his eldest daughter's husband william and dauphin thompson oliver brown was a boy not yet twenty-one though tall and muscular and had just been married watson was a man of twenty-five tall and athletic while owen was a large red-haired prematurely aged man of thirty-five partially crippled good-tempered and cynical the thompsons were neighbors of john brown and part of a brood of twenty children the brown family and their intermarried ann brown says that william who was twenty-six years of age was kind generous-hearted and helpful to others dauphin a boy of twenty-two she writes very quiet with a fair thoughtful face curly blonde hair and baby blue eyes he always seemed like a very good girl the three notable characters of the band were coggy stevens and cook the reformer the soldier and the poet coggy's family came from the shenandoah valley he was twenty-four had a good english education and was a newspaper reporter in kansas where he earnestly helped the free state cause he had strong convictions on the subject of slavery and was willing to risk all for them you will all be killed cried a friend who heard his plan yes i know it hinton but the result will be worth the sacrifice hinton adds i recall my friend as a man of personal beauty with a fine well-shaped head a voice of quiet sweet tones that could be penetrating and cutting too almost to sharpness anderson writes that coggy left home when a youth an enemy to slavery and brought as his gift offering to freedom three slaves whom he piloted to the north his innate hatred of the institution made him a willing exile from the state of his birth and his great abilities natural and acquired entitled him to the position he held in captain brown's confidence coggy was indifferent to personal appearance he often went about with slouched hat one leg of his pantaloons properly adjusted and the other partly tucked into his high boot top unbrushed unshaven and in utter disregard of the latest style stevens was a handsome six-foot connecticut soldier of twenty-eight years of age who had thrashed his major for mistreating a fellow-soldier and deserted from the united states army he was active in kansas and soon came under john brown's discipline why did you come to harper's ferry asked a virginian he replied it was to help my fellow-men out of bondage you know nothing of slavery i know a great deal it is the crime of crimes i hate it more and more the longer i live ever since i have been lying in this cell i have heard the crying of three slave children torn from their parents cook was also a connecticut man of twenty-nine years tall blue-eyed golden-haired and handsome but a far different type from stevens he was talkative impulsive and restless eager for adventure but hardly steadfast he followed john brown as he would have followed any one else whom he liked dreaming his dreams rushing ahead in the face of danger and shrinking back appalled and pitiful before the grim face of death he was the most thoroughly human figure in the band one other deserves mention because it was probably his slowness or obstinacy that ruined the success of john brown's raid this was charles p tidd he was from maine twenty-seven years old trained in kansas warfare a nervous overbearing and quarrelsome man he bitterly opposed the plan of capturing harper's ferry when it was finally revealed and as ann brown said got so warm that he left the farm and went down to cook's dwelling near harper's ferry to let his wrath cool off a week passed before he sullenly gave in besides these there were six other men of more or less indistinct personalities five were young kansas settlers from maine the middle west and canada 
trained in guerrilla warfare under brown and montgomery and thoroughly disliking the slave system which they had seen they were personal admirers of brown and lovers of adventure the last recruit Merriam, was a new england aristocrat turned crusader fighting the world's ills blindly but devotedly the negro lewis hayden met him in boston and after a few words said i want five hundred dollars and must have it Merriam, startled at the manner of the request replied if you have a good cause you shall have it hayden then told Merriam briefly what he had learned from john brown jr that captain brown was at chambersburg or could be heard of there that he was preparing to lead a party of liberators into virginia and that he needed money to which Merriam replied if you tell me john brown is there you can have my money and me along with it these were the men idealists dreamers soldiers and avengers varying from the silent and thoughtful to the quick and impulsive from the cold and bitter to the ignorant and faithful they believed in god in spirits in fate in liberty to them the world was a wild young unregulated thing and they were born to set it right it was a veritable band of crusaders and while it had much of weakness and extravagance it had nothing nasty or unclean on the whole they were an unusual set of men Anne brown who lived with them said taking them all together i think they would compare well she is speaking of manners etc with the same number of men in any station of life i have ever met they were not men of culture or great education although coggy had had a fair schooling they were intellectually bold and inquiring several had been attracted by the then rampant spiritualism nearly all were skeptical of the world's social conventions they had been trained mostly in the rough school of frontier life had faced death many times and were eager curious and restless some of them were musical others dabbled in verse their broadest common ground of sympathy lay in the personality of john brown him they revered and loved through him they had come to hate slavery and for him and for what he believed they were willing to risk their lives they themselves had convictions on slavery and other matters but john brown narrowed down their dreaming to one intense deed finally there was john brown himself his appearance has been often described several times in these pages in eighteen fifty nine he was the same striking figure with whitening hair burning eyes and the great white beard which hardly hid the pendulous side lips of olympian jove one thing however must not be forgotten john brown was at this time a sick man from eighteen fifty six to eighteen fifty nine scarce a month passed without telling of illness his health was some improved in may eighteen fifty seven but soon he lost a week with ague and fever and left home feeble in august he wrote of ill health and repeated returns of fever and ague in september and october his health was poor the spring and summer of eighteen fifty eight found him not very stout and in july and august he was down with ague and too sick to write in september he was still weak and although some improved in december the following spring found him not very strong in april amid the feverish activity of his fatal year he was quite prostrated with the difficulty in my head and ear and with the ague in consequence late in july he was delayed with sickness and there can be little doubt that it was an illness and pain-racked body which his indomitable will forced into the raid of harper's ferry having collected a part of the funds and organized the band john brown was about to strike his blow in the early summer of eighteen fifty eight as we have seen when the forbes disclosures compelled him to hide in kansas where the last massacre on the swamp of the swan invited him he left canada for kansas in june eighteen fifty eight cook somewhat against the wishes of brown who feared his garrulity went to harper's ferry worked as a booking agent and canal keeper made love to a maid and married her and then acted as advance agent awaiting the main band ten months after leaving canada and in mid-march eighteen fifty nine john brown appeared again in canada 
as has been told in chapter seven with twelve rescued slaves as an earnest of the feasibility of his plan he stayed long enough to spread the news and then went to northern ohio where he spoke in public of kansas and slavery he said that he had never lifted a finger toward any one whom he did not know was a violent persecutor of the free state men he had never killed anybody although on some occasions he had shown the young men with him how some things might be done as well as others and they had done the business he had never destroyed the value of an ear of corn and had never set fire to any pro-slavery man's house or property he had never by his action driven out pro-slavery men from the territory but if the occasion demanded it he would drive them into the ground like fence stakes where they would remain permanent settlers brown remarked that he was an outlaw the governor of missouri has offered a reward of three thousand dollars and james buchanan two hundred and fifty dollars more for him he quietly remarked parenthetically that john brown would give two dollars and fifty cents for the safe delivery of the body of james buchanan in any jail of the free states he would never submit to an arrest as he had nothing to gain from submission but he should settle all questions on the spot if any attempt was made to take him the liberation of those slaves was meant as a direct blow to slavery and he had laid down his platform that he had considered it his duty to break the fetters from any slave when he had an opportunity he was a thorough abolitionist 